chapter nine of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the army in motion sprightly sally wister arrayed in her prettiest clothes watched washington's army as it moved down the skippeck road from germantown after the retiring redcoats she enjoyed the drumming fifing and rattling of wagons and the soldiers no doubt found pleasure in looking at her in the bright sun and bracing air they made a gallant array given the best of health and favorable roads they could march well for a number of miles but much of the time bad roads and poor shoes retarded their progress while broken sleep wet clothing or insufficient covering at night sapped the vitality of the best constitutions and made laggards of them all in rainy weather the baggage train the artillery or the cattle if they by any chance went before the men cut the road to pieces and made it next to impossible to march in order a day's march in the canada expedition was frequently as little as ten miles while in sullivan's campaign against the indians the day's journey varied from less than ten to about twenty miles although it at times rose to forty miles in the twenty-four hours major norris in his diary calls attention to the most extraordinary march of his men from tioga to easton in pennsylvania a distance of a hundred and fifty-six miles in eight days nineteen miles a day over a mountainous and rough wilderness with artillery and baggage better progress could be made by infantry when unencumbered the maryland companies of riflemen marched nearly five hundred and fifty miles from fredericktown now frederick city to cambridge in twenty-two days or almost twenty-five miles a day general green's army in the southern expedition covered two thousand six hundred and twenty miles from april sixteenth seventeen eighty to april nineteenth seventeen eighty one morristown to camden or about seven miles a day including battles and camping men were often ordered at the retreat or sunset drum beat to be ready to march at sunrise at times the brigades paraded at sunrise grounded arms breakfast and if the weather was favorable struck tents and marched by eight or ten o'clock but occasionally the men fell into line at sunrise were counted off and marched from four to eight miles before breakfast in the heat of the summer the general was beat frequently as early as two or three o'clock to warn the men that they were to march and the troop an hour later for them to fall into line it was necessary to halt now and then for the artillery and stores to overtake the troops or for the men to rest wash their clothes and clean their arms when the long line was again in motion sometimes in single file as happened in sullivan's expedition officers musicians rank and file artillery pack horses cattle and camp followers the spectacle was inspiring as the two thousand pack horses in this expedition alone covered six miles it is not difficult to understand that the farmer on the lonely frontier might eat his breakfast as the first strains of music came down the road do his morning work and sit down to dinner as the artillery came in sight labor in the fields and return to his supper as the rear guard in search of stragglers passed on the way through the indian country was often picturesque and strange leading over high barren mountains from which the wide plains like another world could be seen below then down into wooded ravines dark and damp with vapor the men noticed the different trees the pine the elm the hemlock the walnut and turned over the soil with their bayonets there was much to see as sullivan marched through the country about the present bradford pennsylvania and elmira new york great stretches of fine english grass spear grass or clover the broad fields of maize watermelons and pompions burning villages and smouldering cornfields were on every hand but such an expedition necessary though it may have been gave no satisfaction to men who sought worthy adversaries and it demoralized those of weaker character there is said a surgeon who understood the suffering that followed the success of their army something so cruel in destroying the habitations of any people however mean they may be being their all that i might say the prospect hurts my feelings 
the soldiers passed the mangled bodies of two dogs hung high on poles to appease the evil spirit that terrorized the red man and denied him victory the spirit had not stopped the invaders who came upon the indian campfires and villages so rapidly that much was left behind in the haste of flight near a hut they found a child of three weak and hungry but playing with a chicken while a milk cow left by the not wholly heartless squaw grazed quietly within sight ready to furnish nourishment a feeble old woman left by the indians to the mercies of the white men received from general clinton a keg of port and some biscuit although no officer of rank less than a field officer had tasted such luxuries for some days with this act of kindness must stand barbarities that would be incredible if noticed by a single writer only lieutenant barton in his journal under the date august thirty seventeen seventy nine says at the request of major piatt i sent out a small party to look for some of the dead indians returned without finding them toward morning they found them and skinned two of them from their hips down for bootlegs one pair for the major the other for myself after reading of this pleasant enterprise which reached its successful consummation at a place near cayuga creek it is not impossible to understand thomas ansbury's observation that the americans loved to kill there was however a brighter side to the war at seneca castle in a fertile country the indians were supposed to be gathered in force as soon as the troops approached the woods and fields in the neighborhood detachments were sent to the right and left and posted just out of sight so that at a signal they could converge hem in the savages and take the works by storm having carefully arranged the details the general set out to inspect the lines before ordering an advance as he rode he beheld each soldier with as many pompions or melons as his bayonet could hold and each military shirt bulging with beans and corn in his wrath he exclaimed you damned unmilitary set of rascals what are you going to storm a town with pompions some two weeks before the above event took place the diarist whose account has been followed afforded amusement in a different way in attempting to catch a doe which had ventured into camp he was knocked down and trod upon by the frightened creature in making her escape deer bears and wild turkeys were not uncommon near tunkahannock pennsylvania but as the men were not allowed to fire in camp nor break ranks when marching animals had little to fear pike chub gar and suckers were caught in the streams near where the army encamped the southern campaigns brought other experiences pretty young women gathered at the roadside says observant william feltman their faces almost entirely hidden by linen to protect them from the burning sun and around them as if in contrast a retinue of blacks without a stitch of clothing to cover them a sight much more unpleasant but possibly equally characteristic at the time was that of a negro's head stuck on a sapling on one side of the road and his right hand tied to a sapling on the opposite side the negro had been hanged and cut in pieces for killing a white man the same writer an officer but probably not more quick to receive impressions in a new country than some of the rank and file comments on the lack of pines in north carolina and virginia the infrequent meadows and the flourishing plantations of the germans and the quakers his eye noticed the gray owl the red bird flocks of green parakeets and some alligators and his ear detected sweet singing frogs if these wonders of nature were observed by the private soldier he was less inclined to record them in his diary after the weary day's march and the meagre supper which followed a tale of hardship and adventure was more suited to his laborious pen james melvin a private in arnold's unsuccessful expedition against quebec in seventeen seventy five has described the ascent of the kennebec into the heart of the main forest and the journey down the chaudiere to the waters of the st lawrence death and desertion reduced the force of over a thousand men to some seven hundred worn out by marches through hideous woods over mountains and through the marshy banks of rivers where the men sank into moss and mud striving to haul the camp baggage through ravines and intervales 
on october twenty eighth they waded knee-deep among alders and so forth the greatest part of the way one man fainted in the water with fatigue and cold but was helped along we had to wade into the water and chop down trees fetch the wood out of the water after dark to make a fire to dry ourselves however at last we got a fire and after eating a mouthful of pork laid ourselves down to sleep round the fire the water surrounding us close to our heads if it had rained hard it would have overflown the place we were in another member of the expedition has described the events of the next day we had to wade waist deep through swamps and rivers breaking ice before us here we wandered round all day and came at night to the same place which we left in the morning where we found a small dry spot and made a fire and we were obliged to stand up all night in order to dry ourselves and keep from freezing three days later the same writer observed uh, we travelled all day very briskly and at night encamped in a miserable situation here we killed a dog and we made a very great feast without bread or salt we having been four days without any provisions and we slept that night a little better satisfied our distress was so great that dollars were offered for bits of bread as big as the palm of one's hand the following day staggering for want of food they came upon the cattle sent back by colonel arnold who had gone on in advance of the party the campfire was the soldier's best friend on the march by it he dried his clothes and cooked his scanty meal it protected him from the cold in northern countries and even from prowling wild beasts by its light he cleaned his gun or wrote a few words in his diary for the family to read upon his return while he slept it gave light to those who bridged the stream over which the army would pass at sunrise but if the campfire was a protection when the air at night was chilled by bleak winds and wet fog there was no remedy for a tropical sun at noon after the battle of monmouth the army of washington lay at english town for two days and set out on july first for spotwood the weather was so warm that nearly a third of the men were unable to continue upon their feet until evening and many had to be conveyed in wagons in virginia in seventeen eighty one the troops were ordered to cut their coats shorter for their greater ease in marching under the hot sun the heat was somewhat easier to bear than the cold in the winter those who had for shoes strips of rawhide which were passed under the soles and bound to the ankles left marks of blood on the snow as they marched even those who had good shoes sometimes kept them on for so long a time that the leather had to be cut from their swollen feet the companionship of many men tramping together was apt to keep fear from their minds but in passing through dark and lonely valleys at night the dread of attack added to the gloom they sometimes marched in single file each man with his cartridge box on his knapsack to keep it dry in wading deep streams and when on a dark indian trail each man with his hand on the frock of the man before him to guide his steps the rain beating ceaselessly upon the leaves overhead and dripping into the pools below the wind sighing and the wet branches creaking in the wind then a flash of lightning that revealed a line of weary muddy plodding men shut out of sight in another instant by the black of night and lost in the rumble and roar of thunder that was what a writer had seen when he wrote that fighting happens seldom but fatigue hunger cold and heat are constantly varying the soldier's distress at such a time panic was ready to break forth at any moment on one occasion in virginia in may seventeen eighty one the lightning struck near a moving column of troops and stampeded the horses the militia thought the enemy were upon them and threw down their arms in the muddy road where they were and rushed headlong into the woods the rear guard which was accustomed to follow the army to stop stragglers and deserters sometimes performed a like duty over the cattle and to march in the dark behind a thousand animals along a narrow muddy road already cut to pieces by heavy artillery was a test of patriotism a passage in the journal of elijah fisher describes simply and well the hardships which the defensive policy of washington with its quick marches and countermarches brought upon the private soldier 
about dark it did begin to storm the wind being in the northeast and the artillery went before and cut up the roads and the snow come about our shows shoes and then set into rain and with all which made it very tedious at twelve at night we come into a wood and had order to build ourselves shelters to break off the storm and make ourselves as comfortable as we could but just as we got a shelter built and got a good fire and dried some of our clothes and begun to have things a little comfortable though but poor at the best there came orders to march and leave all we had taken so much pains for there were brighter days and pleasant marches not to be left altogether from the soldier's calendar a pretty story has been preserved by an aged pensioner who was once in the commander-in-chief's lifeguard it will serve to brighten the picture of the army in motion the men were marching slowly along one day with washington at their head where the road skirted a pond a number of boys were engaged in throwing or jerking stones to make them skim across the face of the water halt came the command then washington said now boys i will show you how to jerk a stone he performed the feat successfully smiled quietly and ordered his men to march forward that is the story to be credited or not as one wills when the soldiers endured every species of privation in camp and on the march it is not strange that they treated the property of people near them somewhat cavalierly as the continentals came in sight patriotic farmers drove their cattle into the hills and put their hens out of reach to have their fellow-countrymen quartered upon them was distressing from the desolation that marked their sojourn permission to take property was seldom granted to private soldiers and washington made every effort to appease the countryside in an order against plundering issued november third seventeen seventy six an exception was made in favor of straw and in time of great dampness of grain in the sheaf to keep the men from the ground at night the custom of allowing scouting parties in time of great fatigue to take what they needed by plunder was greatly abused the chevalier de la luzerne relates that in the winter of seventeen seventy nine eighty the soldiers grew desperate under half rations and took to marauding and pillage this was stopped by washington but as famine set in he ordered foraging expeditions house to house visitations for clothing blankets shoes and every kind of food that could be spared by non-combatants under these trials of war the soldiery and the inhabitants seemed to the french writer very submissive needless cruelty the general abhorred and he strove constantly to suppress the baser element which was as terrible a scourge as the enemy petty plunder was looked upon by the soldiers as ragging is to-day by college boys a form of stealing that should be known by a more gentle name a soldier for example threw a stone at some geese in a pond killed one and stowed it away carefully in the roomy confines of his drum when the irate farmer overtook the company the drumhead had been replaced and his search for the goose was unsuccessful on another occasion the branches of a quaker's orchard furnished some thirty or forty fowls which were sent on ahead before daybreak and later in the morning were cooked with onions potatoes and carrots when cattle grazed on the hillside above the camp and the kettle was empty a condition and not a theory confronted the cook in such a case a colonel was known not to disdain a quarter of beef left quietly at night beneath the flap of his tent or if a soldier when meat was scarce wished to visit a friend whom he had not seen for many years and he was excused from roll-call by the captain he might by chance find his friend in the act of cutting up a steer it would be such a pleasure to return with meat for the company days of privation justified theft in the eyes of many of the rank and file upon one occasion in seventeen seventy nine the troops marched by the body of a soldier hung for inexcusable treatment of the people a comrade slapped the dead man on the thigh and said well jack you are the best off of any of us it won't come to your turn to be hanged again this ten years in the north sympathizers with the king suffered less at the hands of passing soldiers than in the south and yet it was not uncommon for a plain-spoken tory a ministerial tool 
to get a coat of tar and feathers especially during the months when companies from the central colonies were on their way to join the army about boston the british regulars in boston as early as march seventeen seventy five had inflicted like punishment on a country fellow who as was said had been making preparation for rebellion by buying a gun from a redcoat tories were not always subjected to tar and feathers in may seventeen seventy six at a drinking frolic as it was called a tory forgot his caution and drank to the king's success he was immediately dragged off to the guard who knocked the end out of a hogshead and forced him to dance yankee doodle on it until next day in the south there was no neutral ground possible for the country people when the king's troops were in possession of the land the tories drove the rebel sympathizers into the mountains killing husbands on their doorsteps and shooting children before their helpless mothers when lincoln or gates or green came down from the north the tide of blood swept back upon the tories many families in georgia and elsewhere on this account lived in the mountains and subsisted by hunting efforts were made however to protect the royalists and general green in his orders prohibited the soldiery from insulting any of the inhabitants with the odious epithets of tory or any other indecent language it being ungenerous unmanly and unsoldierlike in truth the poor tories found little comfort from either army a new york fugitive declared that the british spoke of the enemy as rebels but the tories they called damned traitors and scoundrels in many towns they were forced to drill with their neighbors and when drafted were expected to pay well for substitutes in massachusetts the selectmen or overseers of the poor were empowered to bind out their children with those of the town paupers the tory while in exile in england suffered in spirit if he escaped physical pain he heard his native land referred to in pompous terms as our plantations and as franklin so delightfully drew the picture he saw every englishman jostle himself into the throne with the king that he might talk of our subjects in the colonies his friends in the rebel army were said to possess every bad quality the depraved heart can be cursed with before he could analyze his thoughts he found himself rejoicing that news of a rebel victory diminished the conceit of the insufferable islanders about him and it may be said that the tory in a foreign land never entirely forgot that his friends and his kinsmen were fighting for the soil that he loved kerwin has shown us these feelings in the story of his own exile and governor hutchinson wished to return to lie at last in the soil of his native land the practice of plundering tories was not so much to be regretted as that of robbing the friends of congress under the specious pretense that they were secretly loyal to the crown this habit annoyed washington frequently and he complained in january seventeen seventy seven to the governor of new jersey that the militia officers had been known to lead their men in these infamous expeditions but robbery was a misfortune less serious than the treatment received by real tories the council of bennington in january seventeen seventy eight gave out the following order let the overseer of the tories detach ten of them with proper officers to take the charge and march them in two distinct files from this place through the green mountains for breaking a path through the snow let each man be provided with three days provisions let them march and tread the snow in said road of suitable width for a sleigh and span of horses order them to return marching in the same manner with all convenient speed let them march at six o'clock to-morrow morning after the battle of bennington the tories were the sport of the soldiery they were tied together in pairs and attached by the traces to horses which were in some cases driven by negroes the same spirit is evident in the remark of a soldier made after the battle one tory with his left eye shut out was led by me mounted on a horse who had also lost his left eye it seems to me cruel now it did not then if the thought and action of the time appear unworthy of men fighting for liberty it is well to stand for a moment as they did with the contemptuous redcoat and his prison ship toward the rising sun and the treacherous redskin with his scalping knife toward the western sun that was no time for over-refinement 
the british army while marching through an enemy's country found the indian allies unmanageable they demanded permission to pillage and torture as their reward for service perhaps with this in mind general fraser told his prisoners that if they attempted to escape they would receive no quarter but would be at the mercy of indians to be hunted down and scalped probably fraser hardly expected to be forced to allow so barbarous a punishment but burgoyne himself found the greatest difficulty in holding the savage allies to humane methods of warfare and regard for prisoners thatcher has described the art of scalping with a knife he writes they make a circular cut from the forehead quite round just above the ears then taking hold of the skin with their teeth they tear off the whole hairy scalp in an instant with wonderful dexterity this operation very serious and painful was not necessarily fatal and a number of soldiers survived the scalping knife as they did battles and lived into the next century after the fight at freeman's farm the indians are said to have spent the next morning in scalping the dead and wounded a german officer makes the statement and when taken with other evidence it does not seem improbable scalps were worth about eight dollars each the price varying somewhat according to agreement general carleton has been accused of paying for scalps and american prisoners of more or less veracity as well as indians testified to this as a fact while it can scarcely be credited as consistent with carleton's known character or as probable treatment of white people by their own race one should not forget that the colonists had for a century and more set a dangerous example a bounty on scalps of hostile indians was the prize toward which a frontier sentinel looked to augment his income as an instance among many the vote of the new hampshire house of representatives may seventh seventeen forty six may be given the tariff was fixed at seventy pounds for the scalp of each male indian over twelve who was at war with the province and of thirty-seven pounds and ten shillings for scalps of women and of children under twelve years of age had the indians joined the american army they would have scalped the british regulars who took their chances of death in any form but they threw in their lot with the royal cause and so fell upon old men helpless women and children more often than they did upon the continentals these were the unfortunate conditions of the struggle there is little to relieve these pictures of barbarity and yet the following sprightly narrative by ethan allen is not without its humorous aspect he says the officer i capitulated with then directed me and my party to advance towards him which was done i handed him my sword and in half a minute after a savage part of whose head was shaved being almost naked and painted with feathers intermixed with the hair of the other side of his head came running to me with an incredible swiftness malice death murder and the wrath of devils and damned spirits are the emblems of his countenance and in less than twelve feet of me presented his firelock at the instant of his present i twitched the officer to whom i gave my sword between me and the savage but he flew round with great fury trying to single me out to shoot me without killing the officer but by this time i was nearly as nimble as he keeping the officer in such a position that his danger was my defence but in less than half a minute i was attacked by just such another imp of hell then i made the officer fly around with incredible velocity for a few seconds of time when i perceived a canadian who had lost one eye as appeared afterwards taking my part against the savages and in an instant an irishman came to my assistance with a fixed bayonet and drove away the fiends swearing by jesus he would kill them End of chapter 9chapter ten of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the private himself the revolutionary rank and file when their uniforms were fresh were a picture for the eye with their cocked hats decked with sprigs of green their hair white with flour their fringed hunting shirts and their leather or brown duck breeches 
many were boys some at the opening of the war were under sixteen with the virtues and vices of youth they were eager for adventure and every strange sight and custom made its impress upon them in the quebec expedition the wayside crosses and the chapel interiors rich in colour interested the soldiers in the march against the six nations indian superstitions and habits of life were described in almost every diary and in the southern colonies the peculiarity of slavery attracted the attention of the men from the north through travel and contact with the world there was an opportunity for the earnest soldier of good principles to widen his horizon and broaden his sympathies the yankee the dutchman and the southerner came to know more of one another some of those who could write kept diaries these journals have many references to the weird and the unusual and they show a rough humour in this respect they reflect the taste of the time privates even those who rose to the commissioned ranks spelled many words by sound when this spelling indicates peculiarities in pronunciation it gives some impression of the language of the campfire david howe of methuen was a private of the massachusetts line with all the sharpness and oddities that characterize a new england farmer in his diary there is a consistency of error which amounts to a dialect he always wrote whelped for whipped and the same tendency is evident in the use of split meaning split stimped for stent and a pecking up for picking up a new englander therefore seems to have pronounced short i as though it had the sounds of an e in get he reversed the sounds in words which properly gave short e saying ridgment for regiment git for get went instead of went lit for let etc private john white also a new englander used a for e and i so persistently that the nasal twang is very evident as in his use of sartain for certain prance for prince lev for leave sands for sins and wall for well privates howe and fisher treated r much as it is treated to-day in new england they wrote salatoga for saratoga dogstar for dorchester sorloin for sirloin yesterday for yesterday and after instead of after but where no r occurs or where it is not emphasized they made it prominent by writing for tieg in place of fatigue cartridges for cartridges always arms for arms water for water and carcel for castle other pronunciations as valuable for valuable bargon for bargain jine for join and jest for just are not uncommon to-day privateer was a stumbling block that had to be overcome in those exciting days and how bravely wrote privatesters and privatesteres to convey his meaning phrases now unused appear in diaries as lit of meaning met for to go to boston and says money an allowance for vegetables the impression which proper names made upon the mind of a private soldier may be inferred from his use of hushing hessians dullerway delaware vinkern lincoln and marcus delafayette or delafayette it should not be forgotten however that on the whole the english language as spoken by the more educated colonists was purer than the speech of englishmen whose lives were confined to such counties as devon and yorkshire the soldiers had their own designations for their enemies and friends the british were commonly called lobsters and new recruits were it is said spoken of as the long-faced people keeping a diary in all kinds of weather with no table to write upon poor quills and thick ink and hands numb with cold or stiff from guard duty was an achievement which must command respect as the scratchy pen was driven slowly across the fibrous paper in the flickering glare of the campfire the writer with brows puckered to concentrate his thoughts and keep from his mind a babble of voices put down much that was instructive and amusing to one the sunday text was worthy of note to another the current price of shoes or the details of an execution for crime mr howe was careful to record deaths and after each name a heavy black line completed the entry as a proper mark of mourning 
sam hawes of wrentham was particular about the appearance of his pages and when he made a blot in his journal he added oh you nasty sloven how your book looks elijah fisher referred to above studied diligently when opportunity offered his diary in february seventeen eighty states i stays with mr wallace and follows my writing and ciphering the same as i had done the evening before for every evening from six of the o'clock till nine i used to follow my study under date of october seventeenth this quaint note appears in his book i agreed with sergeant sam whipples to stay one month with him after my time was out and so do his duty and he was to larn me to write and cipher and what other larnin would be easy it is pleasant to know that this training proved of value the next year when the absence of the captain one lieutenant and both sergeants for a time threw much of the care of the company upon his shoulders the retreat from bunker hill was mortifying to the defeated participants officers as well as men who found fault with the insufficient powder and reinforcements the americans were on a peninsula the approach to which could be commanded by a british man-of-war they did not realize that longer occupation might have induced the british to cut off their line of escape and starve them into surrender a quick defeat for which the enemy paid heavily both in lives and in prestige did more for america than possession of the defences on the hill for another night could possibly have done until a soldier acquires sufficient education to fit him for an officer's commission he was not thrown with men who heard the current news at headquarters his horizon therefore was limited and a battle far-reaching in its influence upon events meant no more to him than a chance encounter a private at the battle of long island ignorant of the critical state of the patriot cause on that memorable occasion states the facts very quietly twenty seven our army on long island have been engaged in battle with the enemy and killed and taken a good many on both sides twenty nine this night our army on long island all left it and brought all their baggage to new york the same soldier thus described the battle of trenton twenty six this morning at four o'clock we set off with our field pieces marched eight miles to trenton while we were attacked by a number of Husing hessians and we took a thousand of them besides killed some then we marched back and got to the river at night and got over all the hutching twenty eight this day we have been washing our things the writer declined to heed the general's entreaty to remain in service for six weeks longer drew his wages and says money and marched for home missing by two days the famous engagement at princeton the soldier's inability to comprehend the state of affairs at critical periods may account often for a seeming lack of patriotism as in the case just cited but on the other hand his ignorance kept his heart light colonel cadwallader less than a fortnight before the battle of trenton closed a letter to robert morris by saying that he had been led into a complaining tone by the damned gloomy countenance seen wherever i go except among the soldiers when given a chance the privates did their share of thinking in the execution of large plans this was a disadvantage since the machine-like corps could better be reckoned with than the body of individuals in seventeen seventy six a skirmish took place between a party of straggling soldiers and some hessians who held a rocky eminence between the termination of mount washington and king's bridge two pennsylvania privates advanced up the hill and opened fire they were soon joined by a few recruits who soon silenced the hessian guns seeing this a detachment of about fifty of the enemy set off to aid their outposts by this time the little group of volunteers numbered twenty or more without officers to consult they talked over the matter among themselves and decided to form into three divisions one to attack the rocky defences of the enemy and two to circle the position in order to fall upon it in the rear or to meet the advancing reinforcements the manoeuvre was entirely successful for the outpost retreated to avoid falling into the trap and the americans took and held the rocky stronghold until darkness came on in any large number of men some there are who will study and think for themselves 
ready or preparing to influence and lead but too many are indolent and heedless when mrs esther reed in seventeen eighty offered to washington the three hundred thousand six hundred and thirty four paper dollars which the ladies of philadelphia had raised for the army she proposed to turn this sum into specie and present to each soldier two hard dollars the commander replied that he preferred a shirt for each man as money would induce drinking and discord the payment of wages often led to disorder as intimated by a private at cambridge in his remark peace with our enemy but disturbance enough with rum for our men got money yesterday rum was an article of daily consumption and its evil effects must have balanced whatever of good it did it was drunk to the health and success of the ladies to celebrate victories to encourage enlisting by fatigue parties to counteract the strain of hard work in bad weather and even more liberally when there was no object in view when taken early in the morning unmixed with water it impaired the health of the men and in long marches the hard drinker was most apt to suffer at the siege of boston sam hawes a private experienced the not unusual effects of merrymaking we turned out he says and went to the alarm post and it was very cold and we came home and there was a high go of drinking brandy and several of the company were taken not well pretty soon after david howe tells the story of two men at cambridge who fell to bantering one another as to who could drink the most this led to excessive drinking from which one of the men died in an hour or two upon another occasion john coleman drank three pints of cider at one draught a feat that excited comment james mcdaniel was so eager for rum that he forged an order to obtain it to check excessive drinking spirits were allowed to be sold at one place only within the limits of each brigade and sutlers were sometimes enjoined from selling after the retreat had been sounded at sunset hard cider was much used as it still is in country towns in place of distilled liquors the story is told of a private then not over sixteen years of age who was taunted in camp with being homesick until he lost his patience and attempted to thrash his persecutor at first unsuccessful he called for quarter but receiving none he fought desperately and worsted his antagonist the affair became the talk of the company and reached the ears of the captain the two men boys they really were soon came up before their comrades to receive whatever public punishment the captain thought meet amid silence he looked sternly at the culprits angular and tall poorly clad by their province and as poorly fed youthful and perhaps a little frightened he allowed his eyes to rest on their bronzed faces for he knew them well then in the hush he said you are ordered for punishment to drink together a mug of cider after the first instant's astonishment the laughter that followed was proof that the captain knew the failings of his men sensuality is not often mentioned in the diaries or letters of the soldiers although references are not wanting stealing however was not uncommon lieutenant burton lost his cotton shirt by a bold thief and a soldier for stealing a cheese was whipped thirty lashes samuel hawes has related how in the camp near boston in october seventeen seventy five a rifleman was whipped thirty-nine stripes for stealing and afterwards he was drummed out of the camps if the infernal regions had been opened and cain and judas and sam hawes had been present there could not have been a bigger uproar swearing was a habit which washington tried in vain to check the coarse language of many of the men shocked him as it did others a clergyman referring to the new york troops who were with arnold in seventeen seventy six remarked that it would be a dreadful hell to live with such creatures forever but to suppose that there was no strong religious leaven in the army would be a mistake corporal farnsworth of groton found a young soldier with whom he could converse freely on spiritual things and said with a grateful heart i find god has a remnant in this depraved and degenerated and gloomy time while every army has its men of low principles they weigh little in the winning or losing of campaigns if the great majority are efficient and brave 
the americans as a pioneer people were accustomed to danger and they were familiar with firearms men might be relegated to the awkward squad to learn manners but the polish would cover a stout heart sir william johnson wrote that the british ministry must not look upon the americans as cowards who would not fight while ambury commented on their courage and obstinacy which had already astonished the officers under burgoyne a continental soldier who had been at bunker hill remarked that he would to god that his people had as good courage in the spiritual warfare as they had in the temporal not to multiply statements the testimony of a tory of new york may be given as final evidence of reasonable courage shown by the american troops commenting on the fighting in new jersey in june seventeen eighty he remarked of the rebels they were mostly militia and stood and fought better than ever before no doubt the militia accomplished all that could be fairly expected of men who did not make war a profession they were subject to panic but fought well when they knew the land and the purpose of the commander and were also sure that no trap awaited them a saying in the army that gates loved the militia because they would never bring him under fire is a commentary on the private as well as the general but men who were familiar with militia knew what to expect dr john witherspoon of new jersey speaking in congress in seventeen seventy six reminded the members that at the battle of preston militia ran like sheep at falkirk in seventeen forty six the speaker himself saw troops behave fifty times worse than the americans had behaved at long island washington said of his own troops in seventeen seventy six place them behind a parapet a breastwork stone wall or anything that will afford them shelter and from their knowledge of a firelock they will give a good account of their enemy but i am as well convinced as if i had seen it that they will not march boldly up to a work nor stand exposed in a plain a few months later he wrote being fully persuaded that it would be presumption to draw out our young troops into open ground against their superiors both in number and discipline i have never spared the spade and pickaxe i confess i have not found that readiness to defend even strong posts at all hazards which is necessary to derive the greatest benefits from them washington wrote these words after the battle of long island five days later lord percy wrote the moment the rebels fired our men rushed on them with their bayonets and never gave them time to load again i think i may venture to assert that they will never again stand before us in the field whether this was due to cowardice or inexperience he did not assert but kerwin the loyalist held to the view that the inability of untrained troops to face regulars in the open was no proof of lack of bravery it has been said that washington's strength as a commander lay in his readiness to learn a lesson from experience he discovered very soon the value of earthworks and persisted in their use without regard to expressions of disapproval from european officers in braddock's campaign his advice to seek protection behind trees had met with disfavor and now lee spoke slightingly of hastily made defences and others considered them destructive of manliness and courage john adams represented a certain public impatience when he wrote the practice we have hitherto been in of a ditching round about our enemies will not always do we must learn to use other weapons than the pick and the spade the motives which controlled enlistment are not easily defined patriotism adventure money glory all have their weight in determining human action a frenchman who spent a year in america reported that all the recruits were mercenaries led by a few patriotic officers so general a charge needs no serious answer but it may be stated as self-evident that the poorer the soldier of any rank the more dependent he will be upon the compensation which he receives for his services the rank and file were no doubt more in need of money than their officers when it did not come even in the form of paper they mutinied their officers fortunately could resign the charge could not have been true in seventeen seventy five later as it became evident that farmers with children to be supported were unable to remain in the army their places were taken by young men who made war a profession and expected its rewards 
the heads of families soon found that service in the army meant starvation for those at home through the demands of producers following the example set by avaricious retailers the price of necessities rose beyond the reach of the soldiers wives said a student of the times at this rate what will become of thousands of people who depended on their absent friends in the army for a subsistence those who having no home ties could go into the army for a small bounty and moderate wages were carried along by the tide what the married men required the young men seeing their opportunity were led to demand claude blanchard visited the army under washington at peekskill in 1781 to his eye the soldiers marched well but handled their arms badly there were he relates some fine-looking men also many who were small and thin and even some children twelve or thirteen years old they have no uniforms and in general are badly clad it is not difficult to understand the physical condition of men who had clung to army life through its few bright days and its many days of privation when one recalls the winter at valley forge it was there that james thatcher while walking with washington among the soldiers huts heard voices echoing through the open crevices between the logs no pay no clothes no provisions no rum and the few who flitted from hut to hut were covered only with dirty and ragged blankets the men were supposed to make as good an appearance on guard and on parade as was possible they were ordered to have their beards close shaved their clothes and shoes cleaned and their faces and hands washed when an event of importance occurred the men powdered their hair south carolina troops in seventeen seventy six were instructed to have their hair properly trimmed up and tied for cap wearing but without side locks pay for the barbers was obtained by stoppages from the wages of the men in our day powder and long hair seem more suited to a ballroom than a battle decimated army the convenience and cleanliness of short hair did not apparently receive the serious attention of commanding officers sullivan's army three thousand strong returned from the indian country in tatters with the remaining parts of their garments hanging in streamers behind them yet they had sprigs of evergreen in their caps and their heads were as white as a wagon-load of flour could make them the incongruity of the spectacle convulsed the officers and moved the chaplain to forget his gravity the language of the private was not that of a mercenary wright of the new jersey line frequently referred in his journal to the philistines meaning the enemy and commented upon the diabolical rage of the parliamentary tools on bunker hill then held by the british another private a massachusetts man referred to the wicked enemy and a less restrained writer to the butchers belonging to the tyrant of great britain private mcmurton of maryland referred to general gage during the siege of boston as that crocodile and second pharaoh namely tom gage corporal farnsworth a very religious man spoke of the burning of charleston by that infernal villain thomas gage and to the possession of boston by our unnatural enemies plain speaking and independence of thought were characteristic of a people less bound by class distinctions and therefore less accustomed to obey than those of equal educational and property qualifications in the old world these traits made their impress upon events said governor trumbull the pulse of a new england man beats high for liberty his engagement in the service he thinks purely voluntary therefore in his estimation when the time of his enlistment was out he thinks himself not holden without further engagement this feeling accounts for a serious reduction of the army besieging boston in the winter of seventeen seventy five seventy six as company after company broke camp and marched away the troops hissed showing unmistakably that many disapproved of the action personal loyalty sometimes found its expression in hand-to-hand -hand encounters between the ardent patriots in the army and those whose zeal was open to question a new englander it is said felt no hesitation when meeting a half-hearted nova scotia volunteer popularly called a holy ghoster in knocking him down on the spot without pretext or preliminary explanation the following picture of the private soldier singing as he suffered is by a surgeon at valley forge 
he studied the details day by day the humorous and pathetic the light and the shade see the poor soldier when in health with what cheerfulness he meets his foes and encounters every hardship if barefoot he labors through the mud and cold with a song in his mouth extolling war and washington if his food be bad he eats it notwithstanding with seeming content blesses god for a good stomach and whistles it into digestion but hark ye patience a moment there comes a soldier his bare feet are seen through his worn shoes his legs nearly naked from the tattered remains of an only pair of stockings his breeches not sufficient to cover his nakedness his shirt hanging in strings his hair dishevelled his face meagre his whole appearance pictures a person forsaken and discouraged he comes and cries with an air of wretchedness and despair i am sick my feet lame my legs are sore my body covered with this tormenting itch my clothes are worn out my constitution is broken my former activity is exhausted by fatigue hunger and cold i fail fast i shall soon be no more and all the reward i shall get will be poor will is dead there was another side to the war picture enthusiasm and excitement enabled men bred to a city life to endure exposure to the dead of winter that under ordinary circumstances must have proved fatal dr benjamin rush has called attention to the apparent effect of the victory at trenton in seventeen seventy six upon some fifteen hundred philadelphia militia during a period of five weeks or more these men unaccustomed to hardship slept in barns and upon the bare ground with a record of only two cases of sickness and one of death the plain living and comparatively regular hours of camp life are said to have saved some men from consumption and other diseases while the change of environment from the too frequent irritation and pettiness of village life delivered nervous persons from their own misfortunes and freshened their minds two questions arise in connection with the men of the revolution how many served against great britain and what became of the survivors after the war had closed general knox in a report to congress attempted to answer the first of these but his tables are hopelessly confusing since they are based upon the number of men to be enlisted rather than upon the number of those who engaged themselves and upon records of the years of their service rather than upon the number of men performing this service by the roughest kind of calculation the total number of men who served as continentals or as militiamen during any part of the eight years of the war must have been far in excess of two hundred and thirty two thousand the usual estimate based upon knox's tables many of these men died of wounds or disease and many more returned to their homes broken in health and without suitable occupation the names of officers and privates who received pensions have been recorded by the government from time to time mention should be made first of a list giving one thousand seven hundred and thirty pensioners whose names were on the rolls june one eighteen thirteen again of another giving about sixteen thousand names in eighteen twenty of a third three thick volumes a report from the secretary of war in obedience to resolves of the senate of june fifth and thirtieth eighteen thirty four and march three eighteen thirty five and of a fourth list a thin volume which appeared in eighteen forty portraits of several aged pensioners may be seen in e b hilliard's work on the last men of the revolution and one of ralph farnham called the last survivor of the battle of bunker hill will be found in c w clarence's biographical sketch of him samuel downing a private of the new hampshire line was the last surviving revolutionary pensioner under the general acts which placed all state and national pensioners and finally all men who had served nine months on the rolls he died february eighteen eighteen sixty nine at the age of one hundred and seven the last survivor placed on the rolls by special act of congress was daniel f bakeman of cataraugus county new york who died april fifth eighteen sixty nine at the age of one hundred and nine as late as june thirty eighteen ninety nine four widows of soldiers of the war appeared on the pension rolls 
in the preceding pages officers have been quoted as authorities on the rank and file it would hardly do to quote seriously the opinions which a private at the age of one hundred and two held in regard to his superiors but a line from downey's observations on each of the great names of the war may nevertheless not be out of place of arnold a bloody fellow he was he didn't care for nothing he'd ride right in it was come on boys twasn't go boys there wasn't any waste timber in him he was a stern-looking man but kind to his soldiers they didn't treat him right but he ought to have been true of gates gates was an old granny looking fellow of washington oh but you never got a smile out of him he was a nice man we loved him they'd sell their lives for him alexander milliner another aged pensioner said of arnold arnold was a smart man they didn't sarve him quite straight of washington he was a good man a beautiful man he was always pleasant never changed countenance but wore the same in defeat and retreat as in victory pension legislation relating to the revolution was summarized by the commissioner in his report of october nineteenth eighteen fifty seven the first general act march eighteen 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 was for the benefit of officers and men in need of assistance who had served in the continental army or navy to the close of the war or for nine consecutive months and allowed to privates eight dollars a month the act of may fifteen eighteen twenty eight gave to privates in the continental line who had served to the close of the war the amount of their full pay whether in need of help or not the act of june seventh eighteen thirty two gave to all persons who had done any military service in the revolutionary war for six months a fourth of full pay with increase varying according to the terms of service up to two years these acts were followed by what was known as the widow's acts the total expenditure to the year eighteen fifty seven exceeded sixty million dollars or less than one-half the yearly pension appropriation now made on account of later wars to state the comparison in another way the civil war the chief source of the pension roll in forty years has cost in pensions forty times what the revolutionary war cost in eighty years this is a commentary on the growth of the country from seventeen eighty three to eighteen sixty five in population territory and wealth and perhaps also on an increasing willingness to accept public aid in the years immediately following the close of the war the veterans too often were obliged to depend wholly or in part upon friends or children for support they went from town to town telling their stories at the village inn or by the fireside to the boys and girls of that time who have passed them on to our own day the hardest misfortunes came in the summer of seventeen eighty three elijah fisher's experiences are recorded in his journal and as he had served for several years as a private soldier they may be taken as a fair picture of the trials of the less fortunate enlisted men he left the old jarsey prison ship april ninth seventeen eighty three and landed in new york city that night he slept at the city hall tavern where he was well treated and provided with a shirt he continues the tenth ah leaves mr franceps and so goes about the city to see it and went into numbers of their shops and would say your servant gentlefolks i wish you much joy with the news of peace i hope it will be a long and lasting one some of them would be very well pleased with it and would wish me the same and others would be on the other hand and said that their circumferences poor at present but now they hoped they would be better i said what then do you think of us poor prisoners that have neither money nor friends and have been long absent from our homes then some of them would pity us and would give us something some half a dollar some a quarter some less some nothing but frowns the next afternoon fisher sailed for boston he arrived in due time and the story proceeds the fourteenth i leaves mr brimmer's at the plains i goes through brookline and into old cambridge from there to the ten hills and then to charleston and then cross the ferry into boston but there was so many that come from the army and from sea that had no homes that would work for little or nothing but their victuals that i could not find any employment so stays in boston till the seventeenth 
in the meanwhile one day after i had been inquiring and had been on board several of their vessels but could get into no business neither by sea nor land the sixteenth i come down by the market and sits down all alone almost discouraged and begun to think over how that i had been in the army what ill success i had met with there and also how i was so wronged by them i worked for at home and lost all last winter and now that i could not get into any business and no home which you may well think how i felt but then come into my mind that there were thousands in worse circumstances than i was and having food and raiment i ought to be content and that i had nothing to reflect on myself and i resolved to do my endeavour and leave the event to providence and after that i felt as contented as need to be with this quaint narrative of the troubles that fell to the lot of the revolutionary veteran and the consolation that were his also this record of the private soldier closes he was a humble instrument in a great cause he profited by an opportunity that does not come in every generation whether france or washington or the patriot army contributed most to bring about the peace of paris in seventeen eighty three is of little moment france and washington long ago had their due it has been the purpose of these pages to give the private soldier under washington whatever share in the victory was his by right of the danger privation and toil that he endured end of chapter ten end of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton